Hello, everybody. Today, I'm joined by Anthony Mallet from Traders Galaxy, and we're going to be sitting down and having a chat about all things body and what the guys at Traders Galaxy are up to. So, Anthony, it's a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, so, I suppose the first thing is, who are you and where did you come from? Because we <laughs> discovered you fairly recently, uh, at which point Lloyd started making little squeeing noises and running around the room like an excited child. Um, but so but it, it does seem like you just sort of blew up out of, out of nowhere in the last sort of year, uh, as far as we're concerned, up north, so to speak. So, uh, so do you want to tell us a bit about yourself? Well, actually, you're not far from the truth. So um, Botwar has really only been going um, a year in its current incarnation. So, um, so it hasn't really been, I mean, it, it's now in second edition. So there was a first edition, but mm -hmm. it's probably only been going about a year and a half to two years total. So I'm, so I'm Anthony and <laughs> I am the owner of Traders Galaxy, which is a company I started just under three years ago now. Mm -hmm. Um, I started it as a part-time gig after completing – it was actually part of my master's for my uni for business. Right. And I thought, well, rather than make up a fictitious business, I may as well actually make a proper business and I know about war games, so I'll do that. And it's a hardcore I, way of doing it, isn't it? Yeah, that's yeah, right. Well, <laughs> theoretical is much cheaper. I will just point that out. <laughs> and I think that was completely um, – Ignorance on my part, actually, to know how difficult it, it truly was. Um, it's all it's all good in theory until you until you start doing it, and then mm. um, yeah, just it goes downhill quite quickly if you're not careful. But um, yeah, so I did that, and I started off just making um, some sort of 28 millimeter sci-fi models. Um, I built my own spin casting machine out of a washing machine because I didn't have any money either. So, you know, why not start a business with no money and no new ideas? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there are reasons, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah to get to pass your uni exam. <laughs> <laughs> well, <yeah>. But <laughs> so, um, so yeah, and and so I, I, my history is mostly through with Games Workshop. So I did work for Games Workshop just in the retail side in the UK. Mm -hmm. Um, I played a, my favourite game before Bot War, I guess, was Warhammer Fantasy, the, the old school square-based edition. And I used to go to the UK GTs when I was over there and, um, and I actually went to a couple of Australian GTs when they had them here as well and, mm -hmm. and several local uh, Warhammer tournaments. So that was sort of my game. I did actually get into 40K as well, and I did play some 40K tournaments, but never as strong as Warmer. Obviously played all the specialty games of Games Workshop and yeah, just trying to mantic Kings of War. So, um, so yeah, that's – I wouldn't say anything fantastic, like, in, in, in out there, mm -hmm. just sort of mainstream yeah, just, gamer, I would say. Just a gamer, yeah. But yeah. That's fascinating in itself that – you took the step then from just gamer to essentially producing your own company right off the bat. And it wasn't just a rank and file square based style fantasy game because, you know, the, I suppose the idea for me, if I was doing a game would be to stick to what I am comfortable with slash no, but you really went off on a tangent whenever you, you started into the, the Traders Galaxy stuff. Well, the, the funny thing is with that is that there was actually quite a long gap. Mm -hmm. So I hadn't actually done anything with Warhammer or anything for at least seven to eight years. Right. So, um, and when I first, oh, it's, it's, it's actually quite a long, twisty story, but when I first started Traders Galaxy, I had no idea for a game at, at the start. Mm -hmm. So I was just going to produce the models and piggyback onto other people's games and just produce models that people can use as alternatives. Like um, there's a hundred companies out there doing similar stuff, you know? Sure. Yeah. And that's, that's what my, that's what I went through uni with my business plan and all that. And 
I was actually talking to a friend in the UK and we talked about, we were talking about pitching a game. Um, well, I started off like, oh, you know, I'd love to make, like there's nothing like a Transformers game out there. <laughs> and, and he was saying, oh, yeah, I thought of the same thing. And we thought, well, maybe we do something and pitch a game to mm-hmm. Hasbro. Anyway, it's a very long story. Not painful, but there's a lot of like stuff mixed up in that. And yeah. um, we ended up, we ended up, it ended up not going through. So long and the short of it. Like we did get to, I did get to the first hurdle, mm-hmm. but like at the first hurdle, it didn't go through. So I'm like, right, well, pivot. I had to pivot everything, I had to change like all, like at the time, the root, the core of the rules were there but they weren't balanced or anything Mm -hmm. and we had um only two factions so basically the whole thing got scrapped and just i just rewrote the first edition of bot war in about a week i think and just put in i think it's had eight factions when i when i rewrote it and Mm -hmm. um or maybe nine and um then had to start going through it. The hardest part was like changing my mindset to like bot war. Mm-hmm. Like, because when you're like looking at robots, I think, and I, and I, and I actually recalled this when I first got into Warmer Fantasy is when I first bought the fourth edition box set of Warmer Fantasy, you know, remember the one with the high elves, high elves and the goblin. And, yeah. Um, I, I, when I got that, it's the first time I'd ever seen why am I right? And I was just like, I'd had Heroes Quest, but never registered that they were the same company. Yeah. Well, that's Lord of the Rings because I was a big fan of Lord of the Rings at the time. So that's sure. Lord of the Rings. That's Lord of the Rings. And I like played my high elves as like Fenor and all mm. that, all the Cimmerillion characters and yeah, et cetera. And, and so I, and that was like that for like six months until I really got into the actual Warhammer lore. So when you think about swapping around, it's like, oh, well, I've got, I need to like make up my own character, but you just can't think outside the box. Yeah. So it wasn't until I started actually converting some of all the characters that they started to get my own, my own characters for mm-hmm. Bot War. And my first character that had its own backstory and everything was a character I made called Hot Wheel, mm-hmm. which you, I think I sent you, you got yes. a metal one of Hot Wheel. Yeah. But he, that's the second version of Hot Wheel. The first version was actually a mashup of, of, of different torsos and and things like that. So, so yeah, and that's sort of where it started. And then it, once that happened, it just went click, and everything just started falling into place. Like I was I was free of that, and I, and so my philosophy here at Traders Galaxy for Bot War has been continual improvement and continual mm. moving to its own its own sort of universe. And so last start of last year, I. I spent, oh, mo- like most of my budget at mm-hmm. um, the start of last year was invested into um, building my own universe. So I wrote, I must have written a novel mm-hmm. of, of how many things I've written. And there was some of, um, one of my Facebook mods, he's a really good writer, Steve. He, he wrote some great short stories and he actually started writing some of the comic, comic um, comics as well. Yeah. And I, I started getting more artwork done as well, like in the Bot War universe. And once that happened, like that's that's when I think that really pivoted. Um, yeah, I was able to kick really, on from there. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I started like it was so much easier. Like the some of the factions, um, like the Deceivers, for instance, their primary inspiration, believe it or not, is like sort of demons and chaos space rings. Hmm. Um, but they're actually they're bots. So there, um, once that, those sort of mashups happen, mm-hmm. um, oh, sorry, I thought this was going off screen. No, no, um, no, no. once that mashup happened, um, it was, it's so much easier now. So like, I'm really pleased with it, how far it's come and, and where it's going. So, um, so yeah, I think I've maybe got off topic of the question there, Jerry. Sorry. No, 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 no. Uh, I mean, it segues in because we, we were going to, we're going to move on to, the games anyway um but i think that's that's a really interesting thing because it is things like this um when we were looking through it that kind of blew us away because you do have that problem with 
Transformers, not just working as an IP, but we've always said that for a game to really succeed, you need at least four factions, and you don't really have that with Transformers, unless you count humans as maybe a third. Um, it is mostly just Transformers and Decept or the, the uh, Decepticons, yeah. Um, whereas being able to run with your own ideas and to expand them and to have this whole uh, alternate 1985 where you've bedded in all of this additional backstory and there is a lot of backstory uh, especially in this this is the turbo edition so this is your second edition yeah uh, yeah i wanted to write i wanted to write the turbo digital edition came out earlier because i was really um conscious of the fact that the second edition I really wanted to embed people more into the background of it. Mm -hmm. And the second edition does, does have a little bit of background, but not at the level of detail that um, we have, that I have available now. Mm. So like the, it's, it's, I'm actually like, I'm actually sort of even amazed myself how each of the 10 factions sort of wind into each other, like, yeah. and connect with each other like that, that almost happened naturally, which is a bit spooky. So, um, but yeah, like it's, it's, you know, go on, sorry, going back to your question, um, mm -hmm. how does someone go from Warhammer to making your own company? I think um, one of the, one of the things actually, um, one of the subjects I almost failed in my master's was about, um, uh, starting st starting a business and and it was um, about innovation mm -hmm. and they said like just to just to st not look at it was almost the opposite of what you would think that they would be trying to tell you is like they're saying don't look into the future just do what you can do now right and like start now so my news it so it coincided that year with the because that was in my second year um, it coincided with New Year's resolution I thought right okay. I have no money. I have, I have no really new ideas. But what I can do right now is that I can try. I saw these internet instructions for building a metal spin caster machine. I can try and do that from a washing machine following these instructions. Mm -hmm. So I put an ad, got a $5 washing machine that leaked, but the motor still worked. And over the course of the next maybe two to three months, mm -hmm. um, I built this, this machine and I turned it on and, the bloody thing worked. I couldn't believe it. And so like that sort of gave me enough confidence to then go the next step. Yeah. So I wasn't like trying to take all the confidence and everything and try and do this, like climb this mountain. I was mm -hmm. just doing like the next step, the next step. And I think even when I probably bet, I think my first lot of molds that I got, like I completely stuffed it up, like mm -hmm. completely. And it cost me like 200 bucks. It was a big mistake. Mm. And like, but I had just enough confidence to get over that failure and and move on. So it was just like with but with each step, you're like growing in confidence and like defeating all these like my, micro challenges, yeah, like all the all the way until you get to now when you got you get bigger problems <laughs> and you can and they're not as you know, normally if it was just at the start, you'd completely fold, right? Like, but now yeah. You, you have enough to sort of okay, this is another one. Just got to go through it. So, so that's on that business side. That's how that happened. So, um, probably not what you're asking. You're probably asking no, more no, about no, them. No, no, no. Yeah. I'm I'm fascinated because you're going into you're you're building the business yourself. You're producing the models yourself. Did you also um, do the sculpting, or did you outsource the sculpting? No, I actually have. I out, initially I outsourced the sculpting. Um, shout out to Dario from Grimforge Miniatures. Mm -hmm. He sculpted my first five space chimps for me. Mm -hmm. So he's a great guy, Dario. Um, uh, that was my first traditional um, sculpted models that I commissioned. Um, but I had then a few different digital, like I was toying with whether I go digital or whether mm -hmm. I go traditional sculpting. And I had a few different uh, digital um, freelancers that did stuff. But now I actually have um, four, 
four guys that helped me out um, that work for me almost full time now. Top blokes they are, and I owe, I owe a lot to them. But um, yeah, they're two sculptors and two artists. So um, fantastic guys. I also like, even though I sort of am the only person in the company, these guys are working for me pretty much all the time. And I also have a mate, Aiden, who does my battle reports with me. Mm-hmm. Um, he's helped out a massive amount as well. So I don't think you can do something like this all by yourself, but. Like I think what I can do by myself, I'm do, pretty much doing everything sure. else by myself. So, but but without those guys and and even without my contractors that that my business other business contractors and stuff, I it wouldn't be possible. Yeah, you you'd be still producing handfuls of figures yourself, I suppose. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It, that's what it would be. It'd just be spinning, being spinning metal on the weekends. Basically, you, you can't grow past that without mm-hmm. people. Is that um, why you've then moved uh, away from metal? Because we've noticed there's a, an awful lot of, of resins and renders coming out now. Yeah, that's right. In fact, I ventured, like, um, I think I was saying two thirds of, of the bot war range is now in resin. Mm-hmm. I'm really pleased. Like, the resin people that are manufacturing my resin are awesome. Um, really yes, great people. Yes, they are. And, and they do such a good job and they're like, nothing's too much trouble for them. I mean, it, I, I don't know how much other people's resin costs, but I imagine, I think mine probably costs a little tiny bit more yeah. um, than what they're probably paying. But I feel that it really sets Bot War products apart from, yeah. from when you, other resins. Yeah. yeah. I think when you're, when you're running a company that is as boutique as your own, yeah. Having that small amount of cost on top isn't a major issue because people aren't going to be comparing this with other ranges, and and having the quality to back it up means people don't object to paying that slight bit more. I, whenever I did the unboxing recently, I was blown away by just how clean and crisp those casts were. They were practically yeah, they fit flawless. together like injected plastic. Yeah, I, was, I mean they are yeah. amazing. Yeah, so my goal would be to have each faction of Bot War in its own resin colour, and I'm moving towards that. Like most uh, most of the resins coming through now are all in colour. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I just, I just think that people don't want to paint them. At least they can distinguish them on the battlefield, that they're yeah. like that they're yellow and valiants are blue. Um, I just think uh, – and they – to me, it still makes up that sort of. A lot of people will say because the, I guess we'll get into that in a minute. Like the bot war rules, the core rules are so simple. You can actually play it with your kids, although it's not recommend. Like it's not recommended for kids. Yeah. And I just think that having all those base, it's a niche within a niche. But having all the bases that you can have covered, um, and have that quality as well. Yeah. Like I have had resin stuff before, and you touch and it snaps and. Like at least there's a little bit of give in, in my it's, – it's not perfect, still resin, yeah. but it's, at least there's a little bit of give. It does behave a lot like the plastic. So, so I'm, yeah, I'm really pleased with that. I, and mainly because I couldn't keep – I would never be able to keep up with the metal production. Mm-hmm. Like just not possible. Even if I was on full production moulds for everything it, it and the weight posting from Australia as well, like is, is a massive cost. Yeah. Yeah, I doubt. So, especially because you are supplying the world with their giant stompy yeah. robots uh, from <laughs> Australia. So I suppose that that is a big factor for a lot of people um, looking to buy into it is if you buy something, you don't want to end up paying double the cost again in shipping. Uh, so, well, so yeah, the I cost to... down is, is good. Well, it's not cost for the customer, right? It's mm. cost for me because I offer free shipping for 160 US dollars or more. Oh, right. So free worldwide shipping. So there has been times where I've actually lost money on that. Oh, God. But, uh, it's, but you know, you got. Yeah. I think in this day and age, you got if to compete. Like yeah. I live in, I live in perhaps you know paradise on earth, but like mm. it's it is far away from everybody. So it's you know you got to you can't have it all. You know. Yeah. So 
So, you know, it's been worth it though, I think, and and the resin has not only helped that as well, um, but I just think that it was a good move because the especially for robots because it's so crisp and the angles are so, so just, you know, much nicer. Yeah. So, but, um, but yeah, like, yeah, I think eventually – probably all of my range will move to resin. Mm -hmm. So, um, but at this stage, my production budget for this year is already, is already full. So (laughs) got some big, big, big models coming out this year. So that's, that's always good. I mean, we've seen the, uh, the thrashers, uh, or trashers. Oh yes. Trashers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, recently. And and that, that is a range of 15. Is it? I want, to say, I want to say 15, but I may be including a couple of the exclusives. No, I think, yeah, pre-order. I think it's 15 or 16 of, of those. So, yeah. um, I mean, that's a big yeah. ask in one in one file swoop, I suppose. Right. But then it gives a whole faction if somebody wants to jump in with, uh, with that as a new faction. They're not having to wait four or five or six months for a couple of models this month and then a couple next month as a, a sort of a drip feed comes out, whereas they can they can play catch up very quickly to some of the already existing factions if they want to go and kick their friends' toys in with giant axes. Well, yeah, the trashes were actually delayed. I didn't, I didn't want to, they were actually, I had, um, they were, there was some trashes in metal, which were based sort of like, um, sort of not conversions as such, but Mm -hmm. almost conversions from, um, various arms and legs and stuff that I had lying around and I'd sort of made that faction and, and it's a quite like game terms. It's like the trashes are quite an outlier mm-hmm. because there's hardly any range attacked. And I didn't want to keep them out of the um, meta for yeah. so long. Um, but, you know, I think the delays that were on the trashes at the time made them better in the end. So, they should arrive around the end of May. I'll probably start shipping out the end of May. And I think having the trashes go back into the meta of the game, I, I think is going to be really awesome because they're just so brutal. Mm. And um, and the next one I'm going to – that the model, the marketing model that I used – sorry, if I talk too much about the business side of things because that's sort of no. – like, but yeah, the marketing model I use for the trash seemed to work, so I'm yeah. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna do the same with coils because coils is next uh, for the revamp. So um, that's I think that's gonna be pretty pretty big. People are gonna mm-hmm. love coils. So I have got some models getting painted at the moment by um, uh, Stuart in the UK, and he, he's done such a fantastic job. They look amazing. So that's interesting to see. Is that going to be one for this year or is that going to be next year's? Yeah, no, big... all this year. Like we don't, we don't muck, I don't muck around here, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got, we've got um, the trashes all arrive. And then I don't know if you've seen pictures of the new destroyer and the builders. So they're, Something they're probably, they're probably going to be, it's all like um, destroyer mm-hmm. is going to be like, um, sort of part rock, like because he's the avatar of Earth. Right. So he's got like rocks joining his arms and stuff like that as he punches people and things like that. So, um, so yeah. So and then sorry for the dog barking, by the way. But um, uh, so and then Turbo Edition is coming mm-hmm. out. So there's going to be a new starter set. Um, I'm not exactly sure of the date of that. Um, but that's this year. Um, then I've got another combiner, which is going to be the Arsonist and Volcano. Mm-hmm. So the Arsonist are uh, Deceiver, the five Deceivers that make up Volcano, which is the um, which is the combiner. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just trying to think. And then the Coils faction, which will also have a big guy, but he won't be a combiner. So uh, Coils have got like this fortress, and that's going to transform. Into I shouldn't say that word, should I? Should alt form, alt form into. <laughs> oh, I think we'll find you. Into a huge bot called conspiracy. So um, coils are like these uh, 
like the deep state type of guys, mm-hmm. you know. So, um, yeah, evil sort of deep state guys. So all their names are a bit like that. That's interesting in and of itself. Um, going back then to the rules, so people can get the, the PDF already, but the, there is going to be a hard version coming. Um, but I suppose that the thing people are interested in is is how does it play out? What What's the meat and potatoes of it? And it has a very, like you were saying, you could play it with kids. It's got a very intuitive, easy system because you're, you're using essentially um, color-coded dice for specific things and uh, energy cubes where you're, you're uh, I suppose it's, it's a, a resource management almost style of, of game on the, on the sideboard. Uh, do you want to talk to us a bit about how you, you sort of develop the rules and how the rules play out? Yeah. So the thing with the rules is like, I didn't want one of the key problems as you probably remember from the old Whammer days and, and things like that is like this, you get these like mighty times of rules. And what I used to hate when you'd go to tournaments is like you'd be playing through and you sort of got these, you get these like gotcha moments mm. where someone knew a, knew a rule that was on like the bottom of page, like 200 and something and you just missed it, right? Like, yeah. or you'd forgotten about it or something because it was like, and, it was, and, it, and it almost ruins your game, right? Like, because it's yeah. like these gotcha, these. And so what I wanted to do with the core rules is I actually wanted the core rules to be as absolute bare bones as possible. Mm-hmm. So there was nothing like that that you were going to like just miss. Yeah. And, and so it's essentially like a, a, almost like a pay to play game. So you pay mm-hmm. your energy, you each, each force, um, each force brings up, uh, brings to the table, like a cert, each, each model, sorry, brings to the table, a certain amount of energy cubes. Mm-hmm. And once you have those, once you have those, um, your force picked, then you can take that pool of energy cubes and distribute it across each of your models, depending on what, you know, you want them to do that turn. Mm-hmm. So the genius part of it comes in though, like it's not just like, oh, well, one activation, one cube. It's like you can start, spending your cubes even when your opponent's like attacking you and stuff to boost defenses and stuff. So there's always that the game is not played in knowing necessarily all the rules backwards and forwards and knowing all the loopholes in the rules. The game is played through choices that each player is making all the time. So for instance, if let's say you've got two cubes on a model and it takes a hit, but you want that model in its activation to do something mm-hmm. next turn. Well, you got to choose, well, hang on, do I want to save the model and boost, try and boost my shields with a cube? Therefore, I reduce what it can do in my turn or do I want to take the damage and still do what I want to do, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. But I risk then potentially destroying that model. So, so that to me is where the beauty of the game is, is in the, the huge amount of, decisions like both players are playing the game all the time it's not like oh your turn and then you can just sort of go get a drink or something like that you know yeah. well turn off midway made- through that's right like you've got to be making those decisions all the time and so and amazingly like when we worked when we play oh, we must have played this for maybe six months mm-hmm. um we found like with these decisions and stuff, like the games were finishing, like I, I think in the rules it says up to eight turns, but like some games are finishing four or five turns, but they were still, you still feel like you, you mentally. Yeah. Drained. Were in yeah. There, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, even, and you, in some ways, like the, because the game escalates in brutality, the closer your models get to each other. Mm-hmm. So unless you've got certain, certain specific models that can lob long-range fire and things like that, like usually the way it works is the closer you get, the more brutal it becomes until you hit close attack and it's really brutal. Like it's mm. so, so having a game that finishes in under an hour but still gives you that like intensity is, was a really nice sort of like 
it wasn't necessarily planned, but that's yeah, that's it just it just how, developed that way. Yeah. So especially when you got two players like Aiden and I, we we like um, we sort of know the game hmm. inside and out. And when and when and when we play, it is very much like it does feel like a contest of wills, to be honest. Well, I suppose after a while, when you've been playing the same opponent, you, you get into that. Well, I know he likes to do this, therefore I'm going to do that. And then at the same time, he's going, "Well, he knows that I like to do that, therefore I'm <laughs> yeah. not going to do that." Uh, and it's it, it becomes very much the uh, Princess Bride Sicilian sort of gambit. Then at that point, do you know that yeah, he knows man. that you know? Yeah, and another um, pleasant sort of side effect of that that sort of of the game as well is that the game swings like hard, like mm-hmm. both ways. So the interesting thing is like, I know um, like some games you can play, right. And you, 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 you have some bad luck early on mm. and you've all, you may as well give up, you know, yeah. and not, it's like, then you sort of going through the motions, going through the motions, but actually but I found bot was not like that. There's mm. been times when we've played and, you know, you can kill like three models like in, in by turn two or three, right? But then that person will still win. Like they come back and and it because it can just swing like um like both ways with a couple of good dice rolls, you know. So it's not um and I, I found them games to be the most fun. It's like when you feel like you're on the ropes and you're sort of almost given up, but then you get a couple of lucky breaks and all of a sudden you're back in the game. Yeah. And it could be anyone's game. So that happens quite a lot in Bot War. And I, you know, I I can only say that maybe fluke, but it wasn't it it wasn't sort of designed like that that in mind. It it just happened. But also you've got, I mean, the rules themselves, people who have seen me scroll through there, are very brief because so much of it is on the card. There's an expanded section after that where it goes into uh, a myriad of, of upgrades and special rules, but then those are limited in the amount that people can put on there. So it, it is a very, there's plenty of depth in the system itself, but the, the actual mechanics and, and the rules to pick up are very quick. Uh, it plays out, I think you, you said yourself, it, it plays like a, a 40 mil or 50 mil sort of skirmish game, even though it, it at its core is a 10 mil scale. Um, and- yeah, and, fun- and funny enough, that's caused me some problems actually because I, uh-huh. I I've spoken to a couple of people like when I when I speak to stockists and stuff like that, like oh, oh. ten mil, nah, nah. <laughs> it's like, but it doesn't. It's like it's hard to explain, like because it is a ten mil scale, but it. But oh, you, you the could majority actually, of the things you're playing with are two hundred. Yeah, that's right. Meters tall or and, whatever it happens to be. Yeah. Yeah, but even the humans that are only 10 mil, there's like three to a base and they, they yeah. would still operate like um, they still fit within the rules dynamic mm. of the like the, the bots themselves. You know, they're just, they're just essentially weaker, slower, um, easily stepped on bots. So, or or, or but, indeed snacked on if, yeah, uh, well, if right. people want to do that as well. Yeah, that's correct. So... So yeah, the game, yeah, the um, yeah, there's been some, been some funny conversations around that, but but yeah, I, I think this, it's it's quite interesting. Like I did, I didn't even think of that, you know, that um, I th- maybe from your weekend video that you mm. did that someone mentioned that, and I thought, oh yeah, there's not actually many games like that that are oh. a skirmish game, but actually it's. There's a ten mil scale to it. Yeah. No, the, I can't. With, I can't even with, think of it. Most with, ten mils are people, like mass combat games. Exactly. Yeah. Without people specifically taking a bigger scale game and just playing it in ten mil, I can't think of any ten mil games that are set up that way. Um, and it, it it is specifically because you are playing that that sort of science fiction feel with the giant stompy robots. Um, if you're if you are looking for that you may find some buried in dark corners of the internet uh but it's certainly it's one of the first ones i've come across that that looks and and feels like that and it's because you can have the smaller creatures not always humans there there are other 
little tiny things that gribble about on bases. Um, and it, you've got that mix, so you you could have potentially swarms of poor, unfortunate humans as uh, they attempt to defend their their island or nation from whatever massive creature is coming, uh, stomping for them. Um, but I, I suppose the majority of the time they would be secondary or supplementary to your main um, robots or beasts on the, the tabletop. So it does have a, a very different, unique feel. And I love things like the uh, the choppers, because having a, a little squadron of those sort of airwolfing it between buildings or blue thunder if you're of an age um <laughs> uh, you just you can almost see you know uh, one of the larger robots like a combine or whatever and then just people doing donuts around it firing at it and it, it's very cinematic it, it is very much like you know the the uh pacific rim or those sort of films where you yeah. can see the the futility of humanity fighting something so big on on normal footing you need to get on their terms with uh fight giant stompy robots with giant stompy robots of your own yeah i I definitely that's something that was um that was thought about in development was the the narrative of those type of battles Hmm. like the you know the scale of bot war basically runs from 10 mil up to 14 centimeters Hmm. so like there's a huge scale there. So, um, but you like, funnily enough, the humans, like the chances of them actually being able to take down a bot is low, but it's not impossible. Mm-hmm. So you do have those, there was actually a heroic moment where my little Atlantic and warriors did take down general, the last damage point off general Duke to win the game. Mm-hmm. So and they, it was it was an epic moment. These three little tiny guys you could hardly see. So that sort of stuff, like that's what I love about the game. It's like the there's something I don't know whether it's visually like there's something visual about maybe you've had the same thing when you're playing um, games or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like something big getting taken down by something like small like that oh, is yeah. there's it's always an epic moment isn't it there's always that that sort of even though it's a game it's sort of, there's an element of fear about the big giant um yeah, monster group bring, brings me back to uh, i think it's jason and the argonauts when they were fighting the the big bronze oh, yeah. talos and they end up unscrewing yeah. the the bolt in its heel and letting all of the magical green juice that powers it out <laughs> and it falls over just going now that'll, that'll harden you till not so clever now are you bronze statue yeah but yeah, you've got that those heroic moments um, where you can, and it's not just somebody crashing a helicopter into their head, you know, not, not yeah. an A wing to the bridge. We have um, we haven't tried it yet, but the, rules wise, it would be possible if you had maybe six or seven human sections, which is the smallest um, bunch of humans. You probably could bring down a combiner, mm-hmm. so because the combat dice stack, but you'd have to be in close attack. And that would be obviously very, very risky. Yeah. But uh, if you're in close attack, you potentially just with the stack up of the dice, you might be able to do it. So, so there's all, someone will try it. Oh, we yeah. we did have a battle. We did have a battle between two combiners, and there was the it was a sort of five minute debate whether we one of us, uh, I think it was me, because I was losing, mm-hmm. whether I separate voluntarily. And try and take down the combiner with the with the stack up combat dice mm. extra, but in the end, I, I decided that wasn't epic enough, and no, just kept ju- juking it out. Yeah, it just toe. kept. Yeah, no, kept beating his fist with my head, basically. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe he'll get tired and need to go for a lie down. Yeah, he you did never it, know. And I tried. <laughs> uh, the the turbo edition, so the the second edition has some. Uh, I suppose you were saying there are are new or alternate rules in them as well, um, which you you didn't have before. Yeah. So the turbo edition is almost very, very close. Like it's, it's sort of like the reason why it's called turbo edition. I don't know if I told you this um, Mm -hmm. is that I've borrowed the, do you remember uh, street fighter two street fighter EA alpha turbo? Yeah, that's right. It's like the world's longest name. 
It's like, so there, there wasn't really anything different to the core of the game yeah. and the core of the characters, but there's all these like extra bits and unlockable things. And mm-hmm. that's sort of why it's called Turbo Edition, right? Because there's extra, um, it's like the, the same core rules, but there's, it's all cleaned up and mm-hmm. like there's, you know, a bit extras. But I also um, took the chance to add in some alternative rules for alt forms mm-hmm. for some of the bots. So, I've, um, they are alternative rules and they're not compatible with um, those stat cards there aren't compatible with if you're, you can't play like half um, non alt form and right. half alt form. You've got, to, mm-hmm. you've got to take the whole of the alt forms um, mm-hmm. if you want to do that. But it's just, you just flip the card over and it just gives you um, new abilities mm-hmm. and you just swap, you would just swap the model out for that. It's um, so they'll sort of put in there just to sort of like, I still like the current core rules, how they are, but some people might want to play that way. You yeah. know, like some people might want to play with a little bit of extra um, depth in it with, with the, with the flipping over of the card and the extra models, etc. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to at least get that out there and, and get people playing. Like uh, there is already old forms available for some couple of the factions um, and they, I have actually done artwork for a few other old forms of some of the other factions at the moment, but I just haven't produced those. So, like, it will happen as, like, you know, and those rules probably in third edition, if it ever comes along, will be tidied up even further, you know, and, yeah. and put out there. Like, I just, I like the idea, like, with my other games like Rise of the Democracy and Broken Skies as well, like the idea of taking a concept and and branching it into different directions, mm-hmm. but people sort of use almost the same models in the same universe. So, yeah. so like, for instance, Broken Skies is a hex-based air combat game, but it uses the, the um, flying models from Bot War, right? Mm-hmm. See, and then Rise of the Democracy is set in exactly the same universe and there's even like a giant um, bot, like a crawler, but in Bot War, the crawler's only like this big. Mm-hmm. So, so you can, pl- like you could actually take the three of those games and create like a campaign, um, like a narrative campaign where you really, like with the Rise of Democracy stuff, really sort of microing in on the human side of yeah of like that battle and then you could take um like a re- like really pull the focus out and play like broken skies which is sort of like your your air combat game which is like a real sky high view of mm-hmm. of of the bot war and then obviously you've got the regular bot war sort of stuff so similarly with um with bot war itself like branching those rules to allow people to play the game how they want to play it with like old forms and stuff i think was just a natural progression of the way that traders galaxy wants to wants to be you know Mm -hmm. do they all share uh i suppose a a similar mechanical concept then the the 28 mil rise of democracy and then broken skies obviously being sort of air combat they look very different but i suppose the way because the way bot wars works I can see them working throughout, or are they sort of separate and distinct? No, they're actually um, the dice set that you use in Bot War is the same for Broken Skies and for Rise of the Democracy. Mm-hmm. So Rise of the Democracy is actually very close to actually the Bot War rules. Like it has um, different special rules, and it doesn't have like super abilities. Mm-hmm. Um, it instead, it has heroic, um, like you can do heroic actions and things like that. So, um, because it's more human or um, people based, you know. Yeah. So there's there's less fantastical things, but it is still a skirmish game in that regard. And it's, it's still played on a three by three table. It still uses the bot war rule set. It's probably got a greater emphasis on squads and platoons mm-hmm. um, in Rise of Democracy than what Bot War has. Um, and Broken Skies. Doesn't it's it's almost like if you took like Bot War as a circle and then just pulled a corner of the circle out in a certain mm-hmm. direction, that's what Rise of Democracy is, and then you take another corner and pull that out in a certain direction, that's what Broken Skies is. Yeah. So Broken 
guys use a similar combat method to um, to how Bot War works, but it's actually a, obviously a hex based game and has mm. a lot of a lot of intricacies about the movement and like doing barrel rolls and and turns and things like that. So so um, all the while, Kenny Loggins' Danger Zone is playing in the background on a loop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So, but they're all they're all skirmish games. I think I've stuck with the skirmish game sort of model as such mm-hmm. because people just don't have a load of time to paint up huge armies yeah. anymore. And like my, a lot of thought went around like with Bot War and Traders Galaxy stuff is like how because this is one of the problems I had right. I think I said at the start. I played a lot of Games Workshop games, mm-hmm. but it was because you're sort of in the Games Workshop world, yeah. the environment, you can't sort of can't get out of it. Mm. So because the the investment both mentally and financially is so high yeah. to get out of that world, it makes it really um, makes it really difficult, right? So one of the key points about um, Traders Galaxy and the, mm-hmm. and its games is that I want the value that people can get from Traders Galaxy. I want one. I want people to be able to get into it immediately, like like yeah. and pick it up and just play it within their first sitting. I don't want people to have a huge have to have a huge investment into doing that. Yeah, and I want them to be then be able to expand out and play a myriad of games of similar without huge emotional and mental investiture and learning a whole new rule set of everything. So they can just like, oh, this is just slightly different to this. And then yeah. so it's not that it's just a little baby it, step, you know, yeah, like it's yeah, not it's, it's, huge. it's not relearning the the uh, the whole thing from scratch or reinventing the wheel. You're just taking it in in slightly different direction. Which makes yeah makes an awful, awful lot of sense. There's a few other companies I can think of could take that view themselves. Um but I won't get into that right now. Um, so obviously bot war is the, is the, the big one and, and we've talked mostly about it, um, pun not intended, but are you developing new things for democracy and for, um, broken skies as well at the moment? Uh, I'm really desperate at the moment. I've, 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 I want to, I want to start a set for broken skies first. Mm -hmm. So, um, just with a few models and an actual battle mat, uh, play mat for it, um, and a dice set in there. So um, I'm sort of researching that at the moment, but Mm -hmm. like starter sets are so costly to to get out in that box. um, And so it's a big risk, but um, I definitely want to do that. Rise of the Democracy, I actually have a fair bit out for that. And Mm -hmm. I have put in, put out like a metal bundle, which I've called a starter set. Uh, most of the that rule book at the moment is digital. Um, like it's di- it, it's available digitally. I think it's only five bucks or something yeah. on online. So and I will be like I haven't got all of the first edition miniatures out for that yet. I think there's about five or six that I haven't um, created. I have um, I have taken a slight break from the bot war universe at the moment, and I'm working on. Um, I've got them right here in front of me, which is um, some Traders Galaxy sci-fi mm-hmm. models. So I'm just revamping a bit of that range. Um, I'm not sure whether they'll get their own rules. They do have actually some half rules, half written, but um, I, I'm just not sure whether I'll do that. I, if anything, if I did do that, I would follow that same strategy of making it a, a sci-fi skirmish game yeah. using what War Core set um the core rules and that dice set as well so um just so i think people. it's just yeah it's somebody just wants easy. to get a chimp with a gun and shoot a dwarf in the face yeah that's right yeah. like it's i think it's just we've all been there like yeah. so definitely want to do that like like i said bot was in its sort of teenage years now mm-hmm. so um it's sort of like we, I think we've got 12 stockists now for Bot War worldwide. So mm-hmm. it's sort of getting there. And I, I, I imagine from my conversations that there'll be a lot more stockists now that things are opening up lockdown-wise. Yeah. Uh, very, 
it's very difficult, by the way, and I imagine a few people who have their own uh, independent companies will know, it's very difficult to launch a brand new game and concept when no one can go into stores to see it. Yeah, you, you can't see it. You can't get a demo game. All, all you can do is sit in your room and imagine what that game would be like. Yeah, I've, <laughs> yeah. I've spoke to a few yeah. people who've run into that problem of late, yeah. Yeah, so that's that's been awfully frustrating, um, you know, and because obviously people in times of trouble, people go with what they know, right? Um, yeah. Simpson said that. It's like... Um, and that and that's that's been sort of the the trouble to get stuff out there, but I, it's it's not been too, like the the stockers that I do have have been really really awesome. Like uh, the guys in the UK, your neck of the woods, uh, mm-hmm. Jake from Firestorm Games and Matt from the Pit Gaming Store, have yeah. been really really awesome. So they, um, but but yeah, like I would say, if I don't get Broken Skies out this year, definitely be next year mm. as a starter. But this year I've. I've told the bot war Facebook group guys, um, this is the year of the combiners. So I, I hope by the end of this year, I'll have at least five 14 centimeter robots available. Um, and there'll be a lot more combiner versus combiner battles, I think. Oh, I so, imagine there uh, will be, yeah. Yeah. If you well, build why it, they wouldn't will you come. Like- yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that that's going to be quite fun. Um, and the quality of the stuff is just getting better and better. Like the trashes was a step up from even the resins from before, and and the new coils will be a step up. So if if I can if we can improve even more, then we can, mm-hmm. you know, we'll just keep doing it. So, um, so yeah. So it's pretty exciting times actually. I, I feel that that it's just it has sort of broken through. A certain level, yeah. So you know, it requires an awful lot of thrust from, a, like, um, once again, probably for the listeners who are in business and stuff like that. Same, an awful lot of thrust to get through that first <laughs> layer of cloud, and um, so. But you know, we'll see how it goes. That's it. I suppose anytime you're launching a, uh, I suppose a, a new venture of your own. By the end of it, you'll you'll have worked out that you've not even paid yourself minimum wage because you're you're doing every hour around the clock just trying to to get it out there. So or a wage at all. <laughs> no way, yeah. So ho- hopefully, um, hopefully this will attract a few more people to the traders' oh, galaxy. Sure will. Um, if you've any questions uh, for Anthony, please feel free to drop them below, and I will do my best to get them answered for you. Um, if you want to check out Bot Wars, there is an unboxing. Um, we have some articles on the site, and hopefully we'll get some Let's Plays if I can pry them back out of Lloyd's hands. Um, well, the, I was going to ask future. you, Jerry. I was going to yeah. ask you, Jerry, what um, factions do you guys want to play? I can send you some stuff over. Like, Ooh, um, well, that's that's tempting. Uh, yeah. I, like, I, need, I need to sit down and have a think about that. Um, if, yeah. Because I know, and still, I know if, if Lloyd wants. If we uh, if we let Justin have Debs, he'll he'll be mattering the game to Helen back. Oh, well, great! Uh, yeah. That's what we want. We want people to try and break it and and try and really get into it because I want. Oh, I would will. love to um, move Bot War into tor- some tournaments. Mm. Um, I was hoping to have some tournaments this year, but it, with lockdowns and stuff, it was pro- it's probably going to be next year now. But I'd love to love to get Bot War tournaments. Like the the game, actually, the meta was. I had a six-game tournament matter in mind when I was writing it. So, uh-huh. with the ten factions, I'm expecting, I'm expecting people to like with a, yeah, like yep. it, it's incredibly balanced game. Like we probably missed that part on the game because there's uniquely Bot Wars probably got an extra lever mm. in the balancing with not only the points and versus power but the energy as well. Yeah. So. You know, so I'd, I I definitely want tournament players to get stuck into it and and wrap their heads around and and because that's where I think you like you you give your game to athletes like that and they really run it through its paces yeah. and so they, they will so, look for they will look for ways to break it they will look for yeah. how how many humans does it take to swarm a combiner and uh, is <laughs> yeah. that is that viable uh, and these questions <laughs> will be answered by tournament players. Well, I'll tell you what. Yeah. Uh, I, I shall have a word with the team or possibly take uh, take a straw poll in the comments because I've no doubt some people will be throwing their suggestions in and uh, and we'll have a wee chat and, and 
sort some factions out so we can get some games on camera in the future. Uh, it's been yeah. a pleasure speaking to you, Anthony. Hopefully no we'll get you on the show in the future and catch up with what's happening in the Traders Galaxy. Till then. Excellent. Thanks, bye -bye. Jerry. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.